Hello, my name is Dr. Jackie Jacob. I'm one of the poultry specialists here at the University of Kentucky. The other one is Dr. Tony Pescatori. Um, we're working together to put a, a four webinar series targeting backyard poultry production in the state of Kentucky. I apologize, I forgot to record this webinar when it was live. So I am doing it as a recording now and will post it for later viewing. I will uh, try to remember from now on to record all the videos, all the webinars and post them online. So in the last few years, there's been a dramatic increase in the number of families keeping chickens in backyard. Of course, there is a question of what constitutes a backyard. This series of webinars is not meant for small commercial operations. We are working on a series of webinars specifically for small commercial operations that will start next month. This series is primarily for those interested in or already have a small flock of chickens for non-commercial purposes. So before getting started with a flock of chickens, you need to think about why you are interested in having chickens. If you think you can produce eggs cheaper than what you can buy in the grocery store, I'm afraid you will be disappointed. The commercial poultry industry is very efficient in the production of either meat or eggs. They have highly efficient genetic strains, can produce high quality feed cheaper because they purchase in bulk, and they have the economy of scale in their favor. With your own home flock, however, you can control all the aspects of production and it can be an enjoyable hobby that produces a food product, sort of gardening with animals. So are you interested in eggs for home use or maybe to give or sell some to extended family, friends or neighbors? Are you interested in raising meat animals? Are you interested in exhibition poultry or have kids involved in a 4-H poultry project? I have been working on poultry project books for a variety of different 4-H poultry animal product projects, so see your county extension office about poultry clubs. If you don't have a local poultry club, consider volunteering to help form one. Poultry projects are a great tool for teaching youth life skills as well as different aspects of science. Before you get chickens, however, it is important that you make sure that you are legally allowed to have chickens where you are. Check with local extension offices. It is not possible for Tony or I to keep track of the ordinances for all the different cities in Kentucky. If there are restrictions against keeping poultry in your area, can you change them? That's always a possibility that you should look into. From the state's perspective, you have to start with what is the definition of poultry. There are two legal definitions for poultry in the Kentucky legislature. For chapter 24, 246, poultry includes domestic fowl raised for profits. So that would technically not include backyard flocks. Chapter 257, however, does not include the need that the chickens, be, the, the birds be raised for profit. So uh, based on that definition, it is um, livestock. So think about that when you are um, looking at defining poultry in city ordinances. There are certain laws with regards to poultry, these are state laws, that must be followed. An important one is that it is not possible to color chicks anymore. This used to be done around Easter time as a gimmick. The colored chicks were handed out as prizes or gifts. This is no longer allowed. KRS 436.600 um, dyeing or selling uh, dyed 
baby fowl or rabbits is not allowed. So don't even think about it. Don't ask how it can be done because that is not the uh, law. You cannot do it. Um, the other law states that it is illegal to sell less than chick, six chicks when they're under the ages of two months. So dying of chicks and um, selling of the baby rabbits is not possible and you cannot sell or give away less than uh, six chicks at one time. Uh, it cost you a hundred dollar fine um, at least uh, if you do that. So when you go to the feed store and the feed store says you have to buy six chicks but you only want three, I'm sorry, you must buy six chicks. It's not them trying to find a reason to sell you more than you want. It is the law. They cannot sell you less than six chicks. That's because poultry are, a, are flock animals and so you don't want them, um, you know, to have two or three where it's not a large enough flock. If you only want three, get together with somebody else who only wants three, raise them up, and once they've reached two months, you can give them away. Uh, but it is important that you, you make the commitment to keeping the backyard chickens. When the, the craze first started for backyard chickens, many realized how much work is involved and they abandoned them at local shelters. And it made the headlines and put a bad name on backyard flocks. So don't do that to people that want to do it for sure. You don't want that bad name out there for anyone keeping backyard flocks. So make the commitment, realize the time involved, the fee, the cost involved, uh, before you decide to purchase chickens. Other considerations. Do backyard poultry cause a health risk to humans? That is often cited as a reason in some of the ordinances that do not allow poultry um, in the area. And one of the things that is a real issue is salmonellosis outbreaks in humans uh, keeping backyard flocks in every year there's an outbreak and in the last year there were 17 multi-state outbreaks we had 1722 cases in 50 states with 333 hospitalizations and one person in oklahoma died 24 percent of the cases were children under five years of age chickens are an animal that has salmon salmonella in the intestines. It's just like humans have to worry about E. coli in our fecal content so you don't want to go swimming where somebody pooped. Well it's the same thing with chickens only it's salmonella that is the main issue. So to prevent people from getting salmonellosis it is important that live poultry be kept outside the house at all times. I know you can buy diapers so that, or chickens so that, you know, some people are tempted to bring the chickens in the house, especially if they're pets, but they are livestock and they do have poop and the poop has salmonella, so keep them outside. Wash your hands thoroughly every time you touch poultry, touch their eggs, touch their equipment, whatever. Wash your hands. Do not do what this kid is doing of snuggling, kissing, and holding live poultry close to your face. That's how you get sick. Clean any equipment or materials used to care for live poultry outside of the house, if at all possible. If it's not possible because it's like freezing outside or you just don't have an outdoor facility and you have to clean in the kitchen sink, please disinfect the kitchen sink and all the areas that you've touched with the poultry equipment after you finished, especially before you start to cook any meals. 
Uh, children under five years of old should be supervised when they are handling it. Anyone with an immune system should not touch or handle live poultry. The CDC recommends that people over 65 should not handle poultry. I think that's a bit young. As I approaching 65 myself, I think that that uh, is really a young age. I think it should be like 85. Anywhere where they're starting to have a weakened immune system, they should not touch or handle live poultry. So what that kid is, when we look at the states that had the highest cases, California was the highest with 98 people getting sick, New York with 91, and Kentucky came in at third with 82. That's far too many people getting sick from backyard flocks. So please be careful when you handle chickens so that we do not uh, have such high numbers again in 2021. COVID's bad enough. We sure don't need to add salmonellosis as a concern uh, for the health of people. Okay, so all the chickens breeds that we see today are all descendants of the red jungle fowl of Southeast Asia. Maturity, the bird weighs about two pounds. The hen lays 10 to 12 eggs a year seasonally. And through many decades of genetic selection, we now have a meat chicken, which we call a broiler, that can be four to eight pounds in six to eight weeks. This is done through genetic selection, a good understanding of nutrition, uh, and good management. You'll often see people selling meat chicken and saying raised without hormones. If you look clear, closely at that claim, you will see a little asterisk next to it. And that asterisk goes down to a footnote that says federal law prohibits the use of hormones in poultry production. So nobody in the United States uses hormones. Um, don't need it. They grow really fast. We try to slow them down sometimes because they grow so fast. So meat production is not done with hormones. It's done with genetic selection and good nutrition and good management. I like to make the analogy of a Great Dane and a Chihuahua. That Great Dane is not so much larger than that Chihuahua because the uh, owners fed that dog hormones. That is be or injected with hormones. That's simply uh, genetic selection for larger dogs and genetic selection for smaller dogs. So um, don't be uh, hook winged, you know, with the with the raised without hormones. Antibiotics that's a different issue, but hormones, no. Uh, similarly, we now have uh, egg producers that, on average, lay 240. Some lay 300 eggs in, in a cycle and they can be white or brown eggs. The original um, jungle fowl laid white shelled eggs. Um, and today we have white, commercial white and brown egg layers. We also have dual purpose breeds that can do for both um, meat and eggs, although not as good as the meat producer or the egg producer. They are reasonably uh, good producers. And then, of course, we got all the purebreds that one can, can think of for show. So we'll look at egg producers because that's the most popular type of chicken kept in backyard flocks, at least in Kentucky. People don't want to kill their chickens, so meat chickens are not um, as popular uh, a, a choice. So in terms of what breeds you have available, there are commercial egg laying strains that have been selected for alternative systems, for free range, for aviaries, whatever. And as I said, that can be brown or white eggshells. And some of the hatcheries do sell them. I've seen Lohman, for example, which is an egg layer, a commercial egg laying strain being sold at um, Rural King. So 
um, tractor supply, you may find some of these commercial strains available. And they're going to be your highest econo economical producer of eggs. The other option that you have is the sex link crosses. Sex link crosses take advantage of the fact that there are some feather traits that are on the Z or Z chromosome, uh, which is one of the sex chromosomes for birds. And you need to understand a little bit of avian genetics. In mammals, the male is XY, the female is XX. So the male, because he can contribute either an X or a Y chromosome to the offspring, he determines the, the sex, genetically speaking, of the sex of the offspring. In birds, it's totally reversed. The male has ZZ and can only contribute a Z chromosome. The female is ZW, so she can contribute either a Z or a W. So it's the female that, genetically speaking, determines the sex of the offspring. And as I said, there are some traits that are on the Z or, or Z chromosome. So one of the ones that we use at the poultry facility, our research facility, is that if you have a barred female, so she has the dominant B for barring gene on her Z chromosome, and there's nothing on the W chromosome, and you cross her with a uh, non-barred male, like a Rhode Island Red or a New Hampshire or something like that. Um, they have the lowercase BBs because they're the recessive form of the gene on the Z chromosome. So the only thing that the male can contribute is the lowercase recessive non-barring form of the gene. When you cross them, all the males will have one dominant and one recessive, and so will all feather out barred like their mothers. The females will only have the recessive B gene from the father and the W, which doesn't have the, the gene, from the mother. So they will feather out non-barred like their father. All the chicks, when they hatch, all have black down but you can tell the difference based on a uh, spot on the top of the head of the males. So here you can see the offspring from a male, uh, a barred female and a Rhode Island red male. And all the male chicks are on the left. They all have that little yellow or white, depending on, on your perspective, have said that, you know, those are all male chicks. The uh, ones on the right are all females, except it looks like maybe one male got stuck in there, which would be human error. It, sexing is pretty easy to do. In one of the trials that we did, Tony sexed all the, the chicks and he had 100% accuracy. So um, sexing is really easily done with the black sex links. There are other sex links. Uh, the red sex links comes by many different names, red comet, uh, red star. There's a variety of different names that different hatcheries sell them under. It's another sex uh, thing where the um, you can tell the males from the females at hatch. Okay, so we looked at the um, the commercial producers. Let's look at some of the dual purpose breeds. So they're, they're another option for, um, as a choice of breed for backyard egg production flock. Some of the ones that I see the most, uh, the silver laced wine dot because of the coloring more than anything else. They're not an overly great producer. Um, Buff Orpingtons are a very friendly uh, female, um, and a lot of people like those because of their personality. They tend to start laying much later than the others, don't nearly lay as much. The two um, dual purpose breeds that tend to lay the most are the Rhode Island Red and the Barred Plymouth Rock. 
uh, which you can get, um, you know, as the purebreds, or you can get them as this, you know, the sex link cross that I talked about. Um, and they all lay a brown shelled egg. Then there are a number of specialty breeds that uh, people have been uh, using in their backyard flocks because of the difference in eggshell colors. So uh, Ericanus are one that they lay a light blue egg and that blue gene is dominant. So when you cross it, it carries through. And so the Americana, if it's a purebred Americana, it will also lay the blue shelled egg. If it's not a pure one, it could be an egg, Easter egger. And then you might get light blue, light green or light pink. And then for a long time, the Morans were very popular. They lay a dark chocolate colored egg and uh, people liked that, but they didn't lay a lot. And so I'm seeing more people going to the Well Summer, which also lays a dark chocolate uh, eggshell, but it is a much better uh, egg producer in terms of the number of eggs it produces each year. And then of course, there are the purebreds if you are into showing uh, chickens. So if you're into going to poultry shows, and I recommend it for anyone, um, although if you have chickens, please practice proper biosecurity. So make sure you don't wear any of your clothing um, from when you handle your flock to a poultry show and don't use wash anything that includes hats and shoes and whatever um, that you wore to a poultry show make sure they're totally clean uh, and or and or not used for the care of your birds my dad used to like the the bantam types because um, they were smaller easier to handle they ate less less feed and he could um, manage more of them uh, without a big expense. His favorite was the, the Polish. He, he really liked the Polish. But there are a number, the Cochins, which do come in standard size as well, are a very friendly one. And they're very popular when the 4-Hers are showing and having the birds out there for the public to interact with. Um, the Cochins are really popular. Uh, if you go for something like the Yokohama, it's got a really long tail. The phoenix as well so you need to uh, make sure that you have the correct um, housing to allow for that large sized tail okay you need to have housing of course um, and there are many 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 different types of housing out there Basically, you need to provide protection from the weather and the predators. So the number of predators in your area is going to affect um, how, you know, what kind of protection do you need? Are they aerial project protector pre predators or land predators? Uh, are they digging predators? You know, can they get through netting, um, you know, for rat snakes or something like that? The size of the house depends on the breed. The, you know, the larger the breed, the more area you need. I would say allow for at least three square feet per hen. Uh, and of course, the number of birds is going to affect the size of the house. Uh, cost is always a, an important factor. How much are you willing to spend? I've seen some really expensive um, houses that you can buy and I've seen some done with recycled materials so you know you get both extremes uh, if you don't want to adversely affect your uh, property values or piss off your neighbor because of the condition of your housing you know please buy something that's not an eyesore uh, and then the run area it's always nice to have a run area for the chickens to go outside um, are you going to let them free run or are you going to confine them? I strongly recommend that they be confined. One, it's a predator issue. 
and two, you're not allowed to let your birds go on anybody else's property. And if you're in a backyard, you don't want them free ranging in the uh, yard that you're then going to play, let you know, let the kids play on, or you're going to go have a picnic or whatever. Because of the salmonellosis issue, you have to be careful of that. And I said, state law does not allow you to let your chickens or any other animal, dog, whatever, technically cats as well, you're not allowed to let them onto somebody else's property and cause damage. So uh, that's one of the reasons that I recommend uh, confinement. And as I said, you can buy expensive stuff. I've seen them at Lowe's. I've seen them advertised online as prefabricated or, you know, assemble it yourself type systems. And they come in a variety of different sizes. I like the one on the left because the nest boxes are on the outside. You don't have to go in. And it allows for a variety of uh, ventilation systems so that you can get out any... Um, moisture buildup or odor buildup. These are, are two from Lexington. Uh, the, there's a, an organization here in, in Lexington that uh, uh, small backyard flocks belong to. Um, and they used to, up to about two years ago, had a tour de coupe so you could go around and visit the different facilities, a little bit of a biosecurity nightmare, but um, you could see the different types of things that people are using. Uh, the one on the left is a simple dog pen that has been um, protected to uh, you know, make it more predator proof. Uh, it does have an area for them to go in. They, don't, they only had the four four or five birds, so they didn't need a lot. I didn't like their waterer because one, it's at the ground level and was getting full of shavings and whatnot, but at least the tube feeder was, was hung up, so that was nice. Um, they did have a um, pan on the side for any um, birds that needed to be isolated. The one on the right, she only had three buff Orpingtons. And her run is sand, and she sort of used it like a litter box. So she would scrape out the, the uh, fecal droppings every once in a while, and that was her way of keeping it clean. Uh, it was a very nice facility. Um, she kept the, the waters at the right height, feeders at the right height, and the birds could go in and out. And she could access it through that window there quite easily, and she did have... Uh, ventilation that she could open up at the top. These are two more. The one on the right, um, the birds are were out uh, foraging and uh, it has no um, bottom to it. So the idea is that you can move it around. And I don't like the fact that you can move it around on your backyard that you're then going to use for whatever purpose that, you know, could get um, close contact to the poultry droppings and uh, salmonellosis could be an issue. It did have wheels to make it easy to, to move around uh, and the nest boxes are on the outside and they can open it up to clean it. The one on the right is not movable, um, but it does have it totally protected in the run so that uh, aerial predators are not an issue. Uh, and again, the um, the nest boxes are on the outside, and there are different ways of opening things up to let ventilation in. You have to watch out with this one for birds digging under, however, um, and so that would have to be taken into consideration. And then, of course, you can go all out with poultry housing. This one is like totally expensive. They have runs and the birds can go up to multiple levels. And you can see that it does have a net over it to uh, keep out aerial predators. So um, you can see that they have water at the top, try and encourage the birds to get up. They do have the feed and water outside to try and attract them outside and they can get to the nest boxes without having to go inside to collect the eggs.
In terms of nest boxes, typical ones for individuals are 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches. You need at least one nest box for every five hens. Although if you only have five hens, I would recommend a minimum of two uh, nest boxes. Uh, you want them darker inside than outside because they prefer that. If they're not using your nest boxes, it's because they're not the way they, they like them. Uh, it's best to have perches in front of them to make it easier for the hens to get in and out so they're not jumping directly into the nest box. They could break eggs th that way. And of course, you want bedding material inside to try and keep the eggs clean. Straw is not the greatest bedding material. Pine shavings are, um, if you're going to use straw, it should be chopped a little bit uh, smaller than that. You want like one inch long um, pieces of, of straw. They might work. Hay, hay would be better than straw. Uh, it's best to have the top slanting to prevent the chickens from roosting and defecating on top of the nest boxes. In terms of waterers, you can use the, the uh, open-ended ones, the, the manual ones like the one on the right, or the bell drinker like the one on the left. You just have to make sure that they're at the right height. This, the one on the left is at the right height. The, it's at the level of the bird's back so that one, they're not climbing onto the bell drinker and causing it to flood because it's automatic. Uh, it also keeps out the shavings and keeps out fecal material um, by having it above ground. Uh, the waters I like the best are the nipple drinkers shown here, and you can start chicks on them and they'll easily learn how to use them. Whatever you start the chicks on is what you should use when they are older. Um, the thing about nipple drinkers is that they have no contact with this water source, which in this case is inside the bucket. Um, and they take advantage of the fact that chickens can't swallow and they have to lift their heads for gravity to let water go down, uh, use water, gravity to let the water go down their throat. So, Chickens have a cleft palate, which you can see uh, the roof of the mouth on the picture on the right. As a result, they cannot create a vacuum in their mouth and are not able to swallow. So if you watch a bird or a chicken drink, they put their beaks in the water and then they lift their heads up for water to, to drip down. With the nipple drinkers, they hit that little trigger, a uh, dripple of water comes and then, and then it goes down their throat. So it's it's less uh, wastage, less uh, contamination, um, and you know it's a great system um, with what we use at the poultry research farm. Uh, I don't recommend open dishes like this one. Again, they could get in there, droppings and manure and all sorts of other things, causing health risks to the chickens you want to separate them as much as possible from their manure and you don't want something that's too small like the one on the right that is a a water for very small chicks not for adult birds in terms of feeders some people like to make their own like the ones on the right uh, the bar on the top is to try and keep the chickens from getting into it and defecating or uh, scratching all the feed out and wasting the feed. Tube feeders are nice because you can fill them up and leave them for a period of time. Uh, so you might not have to fill them every day, depending on the number of feeders and the number of chickens that you have. Um, these ones, the feeders are a little too low. They should be at the lip of it, should be at the height of the back of the chicken, again, to try and reduce wastage. Um, the problem with some of these is that um, the hens will perch on the top of the um, the feeder, the tube feeder, the, the tube part, uh, and can defecate inside it uh, or into the where the feed is. Um, I have uh, had to sometimes cut off the bottom of a bucket, plastic bu bucket, and put that over the top to try and keep the 
chickens from perching on there. Chickens love to perch, and if you don't provide them with perching space, they'll find it somewhere else. So I say perches are extremely important. Chickens love perches. Um, they're called roosts at, for when they're on there at night, but they're also called perches um, for the daytime. And chickens have a pecking order. And if you're at the bottom of the pecking order, having a perch where you can get away from the bully in the flock is uh, good to reduce feather pecking and cannibalism in your flock, keep all the birds happy. So, uh, you know, have lots of perching space available during the day for them. And then they will, they will all get together and perch there at night, the roost there at night, and the fecal material will collect under the, the roosts or perches, whatever you want to call it. Um, so it's easy, it's best to have it so you can take them out so you can remove the fecal material from under the perches. You, you need to remove that more often than you would do the whole house. And, you know, any kind of thing works uh, for perches. This one happens to be round, but you can also use square perches like you can see here. Uh, the hens will uh, use pretty much anything to perch on. And they're especially important uh, in the winter time because chickens can withstand quite cold temperatures, but they will go outside in the snow and their feet will get wet and cold. So when they come back into the poultry house, they need to get up onto the perches to let their feet, feet dry so that in the cold weather they don't freeze and frostbite can be an issue that can cause them to lose toes or even a whole foot so make sure that you have enough perches for everybody to get up there and off the ground to uh, roost at night if you are brooding your own chicks um, it's very hard to buy ready to lay pullets um you know to buy a 12 or 14 week old pullet is difficult uh, if you're looking for a way to make money that is something you can do buy more pullet chicks than you need raise them up and then sell them to your neighbors that are interested in keeping backyard poultry that don't want to brood them so uh, but day old chicks are unable to maintain their own body temperature until they're fully feathered which is usually around three to four weeks of age so they need some sort of heating space uh heating source uh, this here they are actually broiler chicks i think and it has a um, corrugated cardboard brooder ring that goes around it keeps the chicks from wandering away from the heating source and it, so that they can go towards or away from the heat depending on their requirement and they have access to the feed and water. So with brooding chicks, you need to worry about a heating source. You need to make sure you have a good water and you gotta make sure that you have good feeders. If you only have six chicks, you can make a small, uh, brooder like this one, uh, although I would recommend a slightly larger plastic bin. Um, and this was uh, developed when incandescent lamps were, you know, easily available because they generate heat. You only needed like a 60 watt lamp for it to, a 60 watt bulb for it to work. The new uh, energy saving types of lamps do not provide heat so you would need an infrared heat lamp uh, instead of an incandescent one but this one is nice it, it has a way to keep out you know cats or whatever if you have them running around your house but still gives them ventilation um, as I said I'd get a little bit bigger one um, you need to put shavings or something on the bottom uh, that you can um, keep dry uh, and then, of course, you need the chick feeder and waterer. And, uh, you know, the books will give you temperatures to say, you know, start at 95 degrees and then decrease it five degrees every 
every week until you get down to 70 degrees when they don't need it anymore. But the best thermometer is the chicks themselves. You want them looking like the middle image there where the chicks are nicely spread out in the whole brooding area. The ones on the left are too cold. They're crowding the brooding source, trying to get warm. And uh, I've seen chicks pile up and suffocate each other as they try to get to the heat source. So if that's happening, you need to increase the heat. With a heat lamp, that means lowering it down so that, that it's hotter where the birds are. For the one on the right, it's way too hot. The birds are trying to get as far away from the heat source as possible. You'll probably see them uh, you know, laying around, panting, trying to cool off. So obviously it's too hot. So increase the heat lamp to reduce the, the heat so that they are more comfortable. Uh, in terms of feed, you can buy mass, you can buy pellets, and then of course chicks are too small to eat the pellets, so then they break them up to make crumbles. Any of them work depending on the uh, age of the birds. Uh, mash or crumbles for chicks is, is perfectly fine, whatever you have available. It needs to be a starter grower type of feed. Um, you don't want to feed a laying feed to baby chicks. It's far too high in calcium. You want something that is specific for uh, starting and growing chicks. The question of table scraps, uh, a lot of people like to use chickens to clean up table scraps that you maybe you would put on a compost pile. Um, that is fine as long as you know you're you're careful about what kinds of things you put out there. You want to clean make sure they clean it up quickly. You want it at you know after they've been eating all day before you put down you know table scraps. Um, don't want it to sit there and go rotten. You can get botulism or or any other type of disease that's you know brought in by rotting. Uh, food scraps so make sure that you know you put it down before and then clean it up at the end of the day don't leave anything out there to rot in terms of cracked corn or scratch grains this is a problem I'm constantly trying to battle with with backyard flock owners I get a lot of phone calls why have my hen stopped laying eggs? And I ask them what they're feeding and they'll say layer pellets and I'll ask, and what else? And they'll say, you know, some cracked corn or scratch grains that may be mixing it 50-50. And basically when you're doing that, you're taking a nice complete feed that has all the right amounts of energy, protein, vitamins, minerals, everything that the, the bird needs in the nice well-balanced meal and you're diluting it with an energy source because corn and scratch grains, that's basically all they are is an energy source. They're very low in proteins and minerals and next to no vitamins. And so the chickens eating less of the complete feed are going to have a nutritional deficiency. When that happens, you start to see cannibalism, feather pecking, um, egg laying droppings down to, you know, or stopping egg production, uh, shellless eggs, all sorts of problems that go on. So please do not use cracked corn or scratch grains. Just because it's cheaper, it's not a good idea to mix it into a complete feed. Um, if you want to give it to them as a treat, uh, maybe your chickens are free ranging and you wanted to use it to bring them back, only do it in the, in the evening after they have eaten their full allotment of layer feed and then only what they can finish up in 10 to 15 minutes. You do not want to feed a lot of scratch grains on a regular basis. The only time that I recommend cracked corn and scratch grains is in the winter. If it's cold, like it is right now, the extra energy from the cracked corn or scratch grains will help them stay warm. So um, feeding cracked grain, cracked corn or scratch grains at that, you know, in the middle of winter is fine. It helps them keep warm. Just don't do it on a regular basis. 
I should also mention that uh, this picture has two hens and a rooster. Roosters are not required for hens to lay eggs. You, hens will lay eggs with no roosters around whatsoever. The only time you need roosters is if you uh, want chicks. Uh, a lot of city ordinances that allow roost, uh, hens <coughs> do not allow roosters because of the crowing. And it's, you know, cr roosters don't just crow in the morning, they crow all day long. Uh, personally, I think a barking dog is just as bad, but, um, you know, a lot of city ordinances that don't allow roosters, it's because of the crowing. So you have to think, you know, if you're buying something that uh, some pullet chicks and what what are you going to do if you get a rooster? Because, uh, you know, if your city ordinances say you're not allowed to have a rooster, but one showed up as a sexing error, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to eat it? You're going to give it away? Um, you know, you can try and sell it. Not a lot of people just want to buy a rooster. So you could have trouble getting rid of a rooster if it's a sexing error. So you have to plan ahead. What would you do if you got a sexing error in with your pullet chicks? So fresh uh, feed and fresh clean water must be provided at all times. This can require cleaning and replacing the water more than once a day, especially if it's in the winter and it's freezing. You can get heaters to electric heaters if you have electricity close by that you can uh, keep your waters from um, freezing. I have also seen people use uh, water coolers uh, with nipple drinkers on it to the insulation, trying to help them um, prevent the freezing. Uh, and the water cooler also helps to um, keep it cool in the summer when it's really hot. If you want year-round egg production, you may need to supplement the light. Chickens come into production with increasing day length and they go out of production with decreasing day length. So if you want to maintain production through the winter, you may need to provide supplemental light so that a minimum of 14 hours of light per day occurs constantly, it does not go back. Uh, if it's late in the production cycle, you may want to increase it uh, a little bit more to 16 hours, but don't go over 16 hours. You can get uh, timers for lights and you can get light bulbs that are light sensitive so that the lights are not on all the time, but have them come on in the morning uh, and have the regular uh, day length at the end of the regular day get dark so slowly. Uh, and that can keep your hands laying throughout the year. So you need to think about bird management, which we'll get into next week with, with the feed, the water, the light. You need to think about waste management in terms of what do you do with the manure? What do you do with the dead birds? Um, and we'll get into that in the fourth webinar. Um, think about egg collection and processing to wash or not to wash. Uh, we recommend washing, but only if you do it right. Uh, the eggs should not be soaking in water. They have to be washed in running water that is hotter than the temperature of the egg to uh, make sure that the bacteria does not get sucked into the egg and contaminate your eggs. Refrigeration. We strongly recommend that you refrigerate. If you're selling eggs, you must refrigerate. You must clean shortly after they're collected and then refrigerate immediately. Um, make sure that the eggs are dry when you put them in the egg cartons and put them in the refrigerator. They must be at 45 degrees or lower if you want to sell eggs. Um, if you want to risk your own health, okay, fine, but don't sell eggs that you're breaking Kentucky state law, egg law, if you sell unrefrigerated eggs. So you also, as a small flock owner, need to be good neighbors, keeping the house clean to prevent odors and flies. Don't let your chickens go onto your neighbor's property 
and sharing your eggs can go a long way you know but don't make them sick make sure that you wash and refrigerate them and then if you know if the neighbor uh if maybe your chickens make a little bit noise you know feel free to share some of your eggs with your neighbors they'll be a little bit more accepting of having the backyard flock make sure that you monitor your flock for health so keep records on the level of production the quality of the eggs the amount of feed being consumed the, usually the first sign of uh, a health issue is a drop in egg production and a drop in feed consumption um, if you start seeing eggs that are shellless that could be an indication that something is wrong uh, chickens will not eat if they can't drink so uh, just because the feed consumption goes down does not necessarily mean you have a disease problem. First, troubleshoot to make sure that they're able to drink before they, so that they'll consume their feed. If they're off feed for a long period of time, there will be a drop in egg production, which may take a while to recover. Uh, make sure that you're you know, keeping track of the appearance of the fecal material. Make sure there's no blood or worms in them. And make sure that your birds are active so that you know that they're they're not just sitting in a corner um appearing you know disheveled make sure that they are healthy looking and active and egg production does not happen continuously for many years uh, typically you you can get maybe three to four years of good production from um, your backyard chickens um they'll start they'll come into production quickly they'll peak and then they'll go you know as a flock they'll slowly go out of production uh, typically egg weight increases as well as they get older uh, and they'll reach a time when you know the lights they're not sensitive to the light anymore or the eggs are just too big or for whatever reason they decide to molt so they will stop egg production lose feathers and they'll regenerate their their um, reproductive tract back it'll go back to a pullet type state and then it will um, they'll start laying again and as i said you might get three years with that uh, molting uh, in between after that you have to decide are you going to keep those chickens and feed them and they're not laying eggs are you going to eat them uh, you know think about that in advance what are you going to do when they stop laying eggs um, there are no retirement homes for laying hens i said watch the manure consistency this is a typical adult manure droppings versus you know the chick droppings because they still have the yolk material that they absorb before they hatched so the, and their digestive system is a little less developed so uh the contents look different between a chick and uh, an adult and then i have a biosecurity program i did make reference to it a few times but biosecurity program is to protect from biological threat that can be viruses or bacteria or protozoa or whatever external parasites that can come in and make your birds sick. So the importance of a biosecurity program is to keep the diseases out. So you're reducing the risk of sick birds. If you do get it, you're limiting the spread so that's improving the overall health of your flock and it's reducing any mortality losses so make sure you keep track of who comes on the farm or in your case the backyard what is brought onto the farm what clothes are they wearing are they have a hat on that's gone to another poultry house do they have pet birds um you know do they have a parrot right when are they there how long are they there where have they been previously? Have they been to other poultry flocks? Have they been to a pet store with birds? And why are they there? So, you know, all of those things have to be considered um, in your biosecurity program, which we will go to in more detail in um, subsequent webinars.
handling of chickens. I hate it when I see people handling chicks like the chickens, like the the little boy here. Those feet are weapons and the claws, and so um, they're dangling down there. The chicken is uncomfortable and will uh, try to get on hold of something, and so could scratch uh, up the person holding them. So. The best way to hold them is in the palm of your hand. They feel very safe when they're, they have that breastbone uh, supported. And then put the fingers between the uh, legs to uh, restrain the legs so that they're not going to scratch you. Uh, this one is, you know, you're carrying it like a football, which is fine, but you can see they do not have hold of those legs that can um, scratch you. So having them between your fingers is important to restrain the chicken. If you're carrying many chickens, uh, then that will, the number will depend on the size of your hand. It's quite common to carry them by their legs. That is perfectly fine. The chickens are, are quite, um, I wouldn't say happy, but they're not under any real discomfort by doing that um, you can carry them uh, you know relatively short distances by holding them by their legs predators you know raccoons look nice and cute but they can be extremely dangerous aside from the carrying rabies and everything else they can attack and kill your chickens and they are attracted by eggs they love to eat eggs so if you're having an egg laying flock, you know, you're going to, you could attract raccoons. Um, I live in a suburb and, you know, raccoons are quite common. So are um, skunks, um, you know, various things that will attack your birds. So uh, make sure that you are aware of what uh, predators are a problem in your area and make sure your housing protects them from them. Uh, some areas uh, on the outskirts of cities, uh, coyotes can be an issue. Uh, you may have to contact Fish and Wildlife if you have a coyote problem. And even domestic dogs and cats can be a problem for the backyard flock. If somebody's, you know, if their neighbor's dog or cat gets at and kills any of your chickens, they are financially responsible for that so document any cases that you see where a neighbor's dog or cat has gotten into your flock so predator control uh, it's good to have total confinement um, either one of these houses works the main problem is going to be the uh, digging under the the cage part in the one on the right, which I referred to earlier. So make sure that you know uh, what your uh, predator is and their behaviors. Um, you may have to dig down uh, and bury some netting so that if they try to bury, bury under, uh, they get stopped by the, the wire underneath. Rodent control is extremely important. Mice and rats can carry diseases as well as they'll consume your feed and waste it. Um, the photo on the right was a farm that I was working with in Minnesota and um, they make their own feed and they would make large quantities of it and uh, leave it stored like this. So needless to say, they had a mouse problem. Um, and this was a, uh, meat flocks that they were raising and processing their own chickens and they were constantly testing positive for salmonella and it was related to their rodent problem. So make sure that you know you keep your uh, chicken feed um, in a metal uh, container with a lid on it so that you keep out rodents. So don't do that. Uh, we have uh, several resources available. Our department website, rather than the long name, just type in smallflocks.net and that will take you to uh, our uh, 
extension website uh, where we have general poultry information, we have information on youth programming, we have information specific to small and backyard flocks, some for urban poultry, we do do some consumer education, and we have some resources for commercial poultry production. We also have a Facebook page. I'm assuming you went there to uh, register for this webinar, but if not, uh, it's Kentucky Poultry is our Facebook page. Uh, we, I'm also the coordinator for eExtension, which is the electronic version of the National Cooperative Extension Service. And we have a community that deals specifically with small and backyard flocks. That's our website there, poultryextension.org. We have a Facebook page for that one as well, which is Poultry Extension. We do webinars monthly. Um, we have done several for many years. The recordings are available at the uh, website that I show there. We have articles related to small and backyard flocks. I try to keep up a blog. Um, we also have the Ask, an, Ask Extension. It used to be called Ask an Expert, but we're on Ask an Expert 2.0, so it's now called Ask Extension. You can type in your question, it gets submitted to the system and assigned to an expert who then has like two days to respond to you. If you want something faster, since you're in the state of Kentucky, email me directly. That's my email address, jackie.jacob at uky.edu. I tend to monitor that um, seven days a week, so I will try and get back to you within 24 hours. Uh, with an answer to your question if I can. So um, those resources are available in addition to our Kentucky Poultry uh, website. Uh, in terms of upcoming webinars, in two weeks the webinar is on managing the backyard egg laying flock. So we already talked about um, you know, getting started with it, the things you need to consider with the housing and the legal things and that kind of stuff. Then we will talk about um, you know, how to actually manage a backyard uh, egg laying flock. And then two weeks after that, we'll discuss disease prevention and we'll finish up with manure and dead bird disposal so that you're not causing a nuisance to your neighbors.